Millions, when it was first shown on UK peak time television in 1973, and since then seen continuously across the world, The World at War has been one of television's most watched documentary series. Fremantle Media and iFrame have used state-of-the-art technology to bring it to a new public in high-definition picture and surround sound. In 1939, the German army consisted of one and a half million men. Its elite were the Panzers, tanks, six armoured divisions and four light divisions intended for reconnaissance, a total of 2,400 tanks. These had been designed to break through an enemy's defences and strike deep, cutting communications and spreading confusion. Enemy strong points would be bypassed, left to the following infantry to mop up. The new German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, was also designed for Blitzkrieg. It had 2,500 aircraft lined up against the Poles. The most notorious was the Junkers Ju 87 Stuka dive bomb. It was a form of flying artillery, making pinpoint attacks in support of the fast-moving ground forces. The Poles could muster just 600 planes. On the ground, it was just as bad. Poland's army was just 500,000 strong. It had only 880 tanks. It even had 11 brigades of cavalry, lances and horses against armor. Legend has it that some Polish cavalry units gallantly tried to attack the panzers, but it was futile. They were just brushed aside. By September the 8th, the inner pincers had met up. German troops were advancing on the outskirts of Warsaw. On September the 17th, the outer pincers met at Brest-Litovsk. On September the 27th, Warsaw surrendered. The next day, the victors carved Poland up according to the Nazi-Soviet pact. 
The Soviet Union annexed slightly over half the country to the east. Germany took the rest. In the spring, the British Expeditionary Force took up its position towards the left of the front on the Belgian border. But it was dwarfed by its French ally. France had some 100 divisions along the Belgian and German frontiers or in reserve nearby. This imbalance meant that the British commander, Lord Gort, had to go along with the ideas of the French general, Maurice Gamelin. And these were entirely defensive. Then came the hammer blow. The thing that British and French planners had thought impossible had happened. German panzers were through the Ardennes and had reached the Meuse by the evening of May the 12th. Among the first to arrive at Sedan, well north of the Maginot Line, were the men of the 19th Panzer Corps, commanded by General Heinz Guderian, fresh from the triumphs in Poland. Guderian now showed how Blitzkrieg should be done. He ignored the troops in the Maginot Line, and he didn't wait for his own infantry to catch up. He pushed straight on. The next day, assault troops crossed the River Meuse. Engineers began building bridges for the armor while under heavy French fire. On the 14th, the Panzers began crossing. That evening, Guderian's bridgehead was eight miles deep. French troops, stuck in the Maginot Line, were too immobile to intervene. It seemed that nothing could now stop Guderian. He plunged on, further and further, into France. By the 19th, his lead units were past Perron. On the 20th, in an extraordinary 56-mile dash, Amiens had been taken by lunchtime. Abbeville, just 14 miles from the English Channel, was seized by nine that evening. And at midnight, a battalion of the 2nd Panzer Division reached the coast at Noyel. The Germans had split the Allied front in two. At four in the morning of June the 5th, a short bombardment began the final destruction of France. Assault troops crossed the Somme and the Aisne. At first, the French resistance was fierce, and the Germans struggled to break out of their bridgeheads. But, once again, the Luftwaffe helped crush the defences. Soon the panzers were pushing south, and the trickle of surrendering French troops turned into a flood. By the 9th, the panzers had reached the River Seine, and the infantry were only a few hours behind. Once across the river, the Germans found out into the interior of the country. On the 14th, the German army marched into Paris. The swastika was raised on the Eiffel Tower. Hitler had secured the prize which had eluded the Kaiser in 1914. The Parisians could only watch in stunned horror. On June the 21st, Hitler went to Compiègne, where the railway carriage in which the Germans had signed the armistice in 1918 was kept. As a French delegation entered the carriage, he handed them his terms and then left. 
The French insisted on consulting their government, but the next day they were told that if they didn't sign immediately, the panzers would roll again. They signed, and the humiliation of France was complete. For Hitler, his control of Western Europe seemed absolute. He felt sure that Britain must now seek peace and that soon he could turn to the next stage of his master plan. But even though the Blitzkrieg had achieved so much so fast, it hadn't won him the war. The British, battered and wounded, had escaped to fight another day. <laughs> 